Okay, we are in Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, and Paul is, is, is again, giving, just gave his testimony, and he finishes with this in verse 23, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escapes his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day, might become such as I am except for these chains. The king stood up, and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them, and when they had gone aside, they began to talk to one another, saying, this man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And, King, and Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free had, it not, had he not appealed to Caesar. Okay, so, Paul gives the testimony of the resurrection, and Festus cries out, it says in verse 24, while Paul was saying this in his defense. So in the middle of his defense, he was interrupted. So he's giving this testimony, he's interrupted, and, and King Agrippa says, uh, I'm sorry, Festus says in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind, your great learning is driving you mad. So Paul was making his defense, and here the procurator, the governor who is overseeing this says, you're out of your mind. I mean, that'd be, can you imagine making your defense in a court and the judge stops everything and says, you know, you're out of your mind. This is what happened to Paul. Now look what Paul says. Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I use words of sober truth. Now I, I don't exactly know how to read this, but one could read it this way. I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. So you think I'm out of my mind, most excellent Festus? <laughs> you know, so... so you see, it could have been this play that, okay, I'm out of my mind, and so you're most excellent. Or it could just be that it's just a very sober reply. I'm not out of my mind. And, and, uh, uh, but in any case, look at Festus's response. Festus reads this as absolutely crazy. He talks of this as being... You know, you're insane here. But Paul perceives something. Here is a man who is viewing him as mad. But sitting next to him is King Agrippa. And he says, but Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I use words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters. And I speak to him also with confidence since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for it's not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. So, what he perceived was, there was one man who was viewing him as mad, and six inches away from him was another man who was being impacted in his heart. So much so that he says, in just a few minutes, you know, you, you, might, you might turn me into a Christian. This is what we see in life. We share with some people and they think we're crazy. We're utterly mad. And sitting right next to them is another individual whose heart is beginning to open. And you see the same sort of thing in Paul's ministry, where there were women where one person would, would just grab on to what he's saying, and other people would scoff and say, you're crazy. Some Jews would walk away terribly upset and others would believe. 
They're sitting right next to each other. They're hearing the same words. But one heart just grabs onto this thing, and the other heart does not. This is common, and it is typical. It is typical of the way things are done. I, I used to do, do uh, door-to-door ministry. And when I was in graduate school, I used to go with a couple other guys, and we would knock on, on, on uh, dormitory rooms and, and, and the doors and, and go in, and if people who would invite us in, we'd begin to share. And I remember this one guy invited us in. He said, yeah, come on in. You can talk to us. And we began to share the gospel with him. And so as I was talking with him about the Lord and about Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, his roommate was sitting across the room on his bed and listening. But I was focusing in on the young man who had invited me in. When we got done, I said, you know, would, would, do you want me to come back sometime? We can talk more about this. He says, well, I'm not sure. And the other guy, the roommate across the room said, yeah, I'd like to hear more. I'd like to hear more about this. And within the next visit, the roommate came to know the Lord. The first guy who had invited us in was totally disinterested. And this roommate who had come to know the Lord got very involved in the church and the body of Christ and met his wife in the church and got married. And and I went back after after 15 years and and spoke in that church. And there he was with his wife. and, and, And so, you know, it was really nice to see that. But sometimes we go and we we minister and the person that we don't expect is the person that comes around. But this is the message of the gospel. And this is what happens. But now look at what what King Agrippa's response is. In 28 he says, Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. Or it could be interpreted with... uh, 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 are you trying to convince me to become a Christian? They're not sure how to, how to translate this thing. But in other words, he was being touched because in 27 he says, King Agrippa, you, uh, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. King Agrippa, remember, was, was a man who outwardly said that he had in fact accepted the Jewish ways, although he was kind of a tyrant. But, but uh, uh, he, he had talked about his acceptance of the Jewish ways. So Paul knew that there was something there of the understanding of the prophets. And, and if we take it in the sense that, that uh, uh, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian, the man's heart was being touched. But now look at his response in verse 29. And Paul said, I wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. So remember, a Roman prisoner was always in chains. Always in chains, and always chained to a guard. So Paul didn't have... You know, Paul, for this entire time, he was chained. And he testifies, except for these chains. He had chains on him at that time, even during his trial. So Paul is heavily restricted. And he says, I would to God that that all of you, everyone who hears this, would become Christians. Now, do we see here then King Agrippa giving a profession of faith? Do we see that? Do we see King Agrippa coming to the altar and bowing down? We don't see that. But the man was touched. There was something that happened in his heart. But we have no scriptural evidence for this man ever coming to the faith, though his heart was touched. Many people's hearts are touched by the gospel and never take that step to accept the Lord. In verse 30, it says, The king stood up, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone aside, they began talking with one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. Again, a proclamation of Paul's innocence. Remember, uh, 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 Lysias, the, the, uh, the, the one in charge of the troops in Jerusalem, had proclaimed his innocence. And at each trial, his innocence had been proclaimed. But still, he's in chains. So if you ever feel dumped on in life, just remember this. This man again and again was proclaimed innocent. But still, he remained in chains. But since he had appealed to Caesar, to Caesar he must go. They say that. 
In verse 32, And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So to Caesar he must go. He should have been set free. But remember, Festus, in order to appease the Jews, wanted him to go to Jerusalem to stand trial. Paul said, No, I am standing before the proper court, knowing that in Jerusalem laid a plot for his life. And he says that if you're going to try me, I need to be tried here. His only way out was to appeal to Caesar. So remember what God had told Paul. Back, let's look a uh, few chapters back in chapter, chapter uh, uh, 23 of the book of Acts, verse 11. But on that night, immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage. For as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. That's Acts 23.11. So Jesus had come in a vision to Paul and said, You will witness in Rome. As you witnessed in Jerusalem, you will witness in Rome. And this is the means by which Paul is going to get to Rome. In chains. I mean, couldn't you make it more comfortable? Couldn't there have been an easier way? You look throughout the Scriptures. It is rare when the way is made easy. Philip the Evangelist was transported, it seems like, by an angel to go and to share with the Ethiopian uh, eunuch. But this is a rare occurrence in the Scriptures. Usually it is through great trial that things are done. Look at Paul's missionary journeys. Through great trials, the will of God is often accomplished. If we think that because we're going through great trials, somehow God is not with us, it could be that if everything is easy, we would rather think God must not be with us. Walking the Christian life is never particularly easy, rarely particularly easy in the Scriptures. Things are done with hardships and in chains. And it's going to get even harder upon Paul. Remember, he's still in prison. He's very much in jail. He's very much chained to a guard at all times. And so now he's about to be shipped off. But remember the life here. We are to witness. Now, you don't see Paul bemoaning the fact, Oh, I just can't believe this. God gave me a forum to speak to a king, King Agrippa. And a second testimony to, to, uh, to Festus. And neither of them got saved. And Bernice didn't get saved. And as far as I can tell, nobody here got saved. I must be a terrible witness. God forgive me, I'm just so bad at this, I think I'll just stop. Just not good at it, because whenever I preach, people just get further from the Lord. They think I'm crazy. They think this is madness. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever shared and thought, boy, I've messed it up worse than if the person had never heard? It's happened to me a lot of times. A lot of times. I mean, I've even gone so far as to get arguing with the person. I've done it. I'm not proud of it. I'm just telling you that's how far I've gone where I've argued with the person, now they're really turned off. And especially with my family. Because witnessing to your family, at least for me, is the hardest thing, because they know what I'm really like. And so, you, you know, you go trying to share with your mother and your father and your sister and your brother, and like, who are you? And, the, and, and you end up arguing with them. But Paul doesn't go beating himself up over the fact that people aren't saved. Salvation is not our job. Salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit. We are called not to be saviors, but to be a witness. We are called to witness of Him. Sometimes we do it well. Sometimes we do it less well. And I have had people critique and criticize the way I do it. But when I ask them, how do you do it? They generally don't do it at all. So if you're going to do it, you're going to mess up sometimes. Sometimes you're going to do it and people aren't going to be saved. Sometimes you're going to feel like people are further away than they were to begin with. 
Maybe so. I mean, here Festus is going away thinking Christianity is madness. If this is the key representative, he's a, he's a fruitcake. So everyone who follows his example must be a fruitcake. This is Festus' view now of Christianity. Would have been better to have even left him alone, one could argue. But Paul didn't feel that way. This is what being a believer is. We witness and we testify. Now we get to the, the, the boat trip to Rome. So, God sends a, 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 you know, the carnival cruise line, and Paul hops on board, and he's wined and dined all the way to Rome. One would think that this would be God's way, right? God, you know, should transport him comfortably because Jesus said to him, you will witness in Rome. So shouldn't he make it easy? Lord, you, you said that, you know, you spoke to my heart that I was, you know, I was going to be a physician. And I'm not doing very well. I'm in route, but I'm not doing very well. I mean... You know, the process sometimes has a lot of pain because, because God's doing something. I don't know always what. was God. Maybe God was conforming Paul more to his image. Maybe this was a witness to all the people around him. We could pick out many things. But it's never very easy to walk with the Lord. This is Christian life. You are not unique in your struggles. I thought, if I walk with God... You know, my marriage would go well. Sometimes it does. But sometimes for no fault of your own, it doesn't. Because there's another individual here. And that individual has free choice. And that individual may make a choice to go and have an affair. That happens to very good people that love God. Where the other individual causes great pain in their lives. You can have... Very good parents, devoted parents who gave of themselves to God and to their children. And one of their kids just is, get, makes their lives miserable. Miserable. This can happen. I don't know why this happens, but it causes us certainly to cry out more to God. But life is like this. Okay, so look at, at Paul in this, in this journey to Rome. Verse, uh, chapter 27 of the book of Acts. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in an, uh, in an Adramatian ship, which was about to set sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. The next day, we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. From there, we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed through the sea along the coast of uh, Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at, at Mara in Lycia. There, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard it. Okay, so what do you do? You go and you, you find ships that are going in the general direction that you want to go, and you pay for passage. And that's generally what they would do. They would go to the port, they would find a ship, because there weren't, you couldn't get online and, and, and book this thing. So you go to the port, and, and you find this thing. And we see the same thing uh, many, many years earlier, I don't know, seven, eight hundred years earlier, no, maybe six hundred years earlier with Jonah. You know, Jonah had gone to the port and, and uh, God told him to get a ship to go in one direction. He got a ship to go in the other direction and then God intervened in that. So they get on this ship and they're, they're committed to the care, to the custody of, of uh, this centurion. So this centurion is over 100 troops. So there, there's a hundred troops, and he's of this Augustan cohort. So every cohort had a name. This was called the Augustan cohort. So there's a hundred troops guarding not just Paul, but a number of other prisoners. And they embarked on this ship, and they first went up and they put in at Sidon, which is, which is north of, of Israel. And so they put in at Sidon. And already Paul is finding favor 
with this centurion. So much so that the centurion allows him to go and get ministered to by some of his friends in this port. But remember, he's still chained to a guard. But he goes and he gets some care. But with him are two people. With Paul, it says, We put out to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, the Macedonian of Thessalonica. Aristarchus we had seen before, actually in in Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, it says in verse 28, When they had heard this, they were filled with rage and began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging out Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. So Aristarchus has realized when you travel with Paul, you go through great trouble. They almost killed him that day, just because he was Paul's traveling companion. But here he was again, going on this ship with Paul. He wasn't a prisoner, he was just going to minister with Paul. So there's two people with Paul. One is Luke, who is writing this account because he says, we boarded the ship along with Aristarchus. So along with Paul are Luke, the physician, Luke, the, the, the writer, and Aristarchus are traveling with Paul. And so then you get this documentation. You can, you can look at the map in the back of your Bible and just track this thing and see where, the, where they, they had gone. And so uh, these months actually in the, uh, in the Mediterranean are considered quite, quite violent mo- months as far as sea travel. And in fact, so from November till about February, they don't travel. They didn't travel over the Mediterranean because the seas were too rough and the winds too contrary. So it says, uh, um, then in verse 6, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship set, setting sail for Italy and put us aboard it. And when they had sailed slowly for a good many days with difficulty, they arrived at, at, at Sindus, since the wind did not permit us to go farther. We sailed under the shelter of Crete, of uh, Salmon, and with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near, near which was the city of Lacia. When considerable time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them, and said to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. So, uh, what Luke does is he marks it with relation to the fast. And, and uh, he, he may well be talking about the fast after the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles uh, uh, during that, n- near that time. And so it is, it is well into probably November. But that Luke marks it in relation to the Jewish fast is again another indication that Luke may well have been a Jew. Because there's several things that he marks specifically with time that would only mean something to a Jew. And he marks this in relation to the Jewish fast. And he says, so, so he marks the time. And, and he says that, the da- that, that there's going to be a lot of danger here. So Paul speaks up. So in, in verse 10, and he says to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there if somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. And when a moderate south wind came up, supposing that they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete, close inshore. So what Paul speaks up here, in, in, when, when he speaks about this, in verse 10, he says, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, and even of our lives. He is not speaking a specific word of knowledge or revelation, and we know that. Because he says, I perceive this. He says, this is a feeling that I have. That there's trouble brewing. But the specificity of it cannot be from God, because Paul didn't lose his life. In fact, none of them lost their lives. 
later on, an angel is going to come and speak specifically to Paul what's going to take place. But this is important that we distinguish between something that is spoken of absolute truth to us. Like Jesus stood at Paul's side and said, you have solemnly witnessed at Jerusalem. You must witness now in Rome also. That is a specific word which is definitely going to come to pass because the Lord himself spoke that. The angel is going to come to Paul along this journey and say that God has granted you your life as well as all the other people traveling with you. God has granted that. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see that that the angel does speak that. But at this point, Paul doesn't receive any precise word. There's this word of wisdom that he has. He says, you know, there's going to be real trouble here. This is a journey that is, is destined to undergo trouble. I perceive this is some feeling that I have. It's important for us as believers to understand this distinction and speak properly with this distinction. So in other words, if, if I say to you, you know, somebody is really distraught. They've got a, uh, you know, they come to me and they, they, they say, my, you know, the doctor has found something with me. They, they, they found a cyst and, you know, it really, it really could be bad. And I try to calm them down and I say, and I pray and I say, you know, you're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. I don't have a revelation from Jesus Christ that says, this person is going to be okay. This is just a perception that I have, a word that I have to want to strengthen them and encourage them, and I have to speak it right. I cannot say to them, God has told me you will be okay. That would be wrong of me to say, God has told me you will be okay. And I am very, very careful about saying, God has told me something. Because I have been wrong so often when I have perceived that God has told me something that if I were to say God has told me I should be killed as a false prophet, I perceive in my spirit that you're going to be all right. I encourage you. I was speaking to a young lady last night that her her, her infant is ill. And they said, you know, they, they have to do all these tests. And they said, your boy's going to be okay. He's going to be okay. I, don't, I have no revelation from God. I just prayed and I had a sense of peace. You see what I mean? The distinction is important. Or else what happens is we start willy-nillying, going through and throwing out words of the Lord. The Lord has spoken to me. And I know a lot of Christians do that. And I take that very carefully. The Lord has spoken to me and said this. Well, how did he speak to you? In what way? And then they get a little antsy. Right, it, 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 it's, you know, this word of knowledge. He spoke to me. I'm, I'm just trying to put some qualifiers on it because I really want to know for sure. Do you see what I mean, the distinction? How much trouble we can cause in his name to throw around and to say, the Lord has said this. And a lot of people do that. The Lord is, is, is saying this. Well, the Lord is not saying that. You are saying that. And I'd like to receive that. It's not that what you're saying is bad. It is a word of encouragement. But don't take it and speak it as if it's Scripture. And as if it's a revelation that an angel has come to you and spoken because I know from my own mind how, how susceptible I am to hear from Jim Tour. Lord, I pray that when I get there, there'll be a parking space. The Lord has spoken to me, there will be a parking space. When you turn the corner, it will be there. I have been so wrong on that so many times in my own mind. How dare I throw that upon someone else and then accuse them of not having enough faith to have received the Lord, that I, the word of the Lord that I gave them that never was the word of the Lord. It was the word of Jim Tour. Do you see what I mean? Very important for us. And I am not trying to negate anything or put down anything that anybody else is doing. I am saying for myself, for Jim Tour, I don't go around saying the Lord says such and such until I can read that verse from the Bible. When I've read that verse from the Bible, I say, this is what the Lord is saying. In the context of your life, I don't know precisely 
unless it has the context for believers at large. So in other words, that when we die, we will be for him, with Him forever. That is in the context of all humankind, whether Jew or Gentile, those who know Him. I can speak that confidently to you. When it says, and He will heal all your diseases, I don't throw that towards somebody. I don't know precisely what He's going to do in the context of the healing that they are asking for. I know in the long run, you will live for the Lord, with the Lord forever because Jesus said, He who lives and believes in me will live even if he dies. And whoever believes in me will never die. And I know that when we know him, we will live with him forever. But within that context, people have to die. It is given for man to be born once and then to die and then comes judgment. And unless we are of the generation that are going to be taken up by the Lord, because he's going to come and and receive the church in our generation, and every generation has thought it was going to come in their generation. And every generation before this one was wrong. So chances are, if we think it's going to come in our generation, statistically we're going to be wrong. (laughs) So I, you know, I don't know that you're not going to die. I presume you're all going to die. And I presume that you're not all going to get run over by cars, that some of you are going to die of sickness. So for me to come to you in the hospital and say, He heals all your diseases, believe it. Believe it. (laughs) If you you would only believe this, you'd be okay. It's wrong of me to do that. I will pray for you and I'll say, God, have mercy and heal. For me to pray for healing is different than than, than saying, the Lord says, He heals you. You see what I mean? We have to be very careful about taking the Lord's words out of context, context, and proclaiming it as His Word. And Paul said, I perceive we're going to have real trouble. And that we're even going to lose our lives. Well, Paul wasn't precisely correct. He later on gets the Word of the Lord. This was his perception. Basically, he was correct. They were going to have real trouble, and had he not interceded, they were all going to die. But his perception wasn't quite perfect. And then we put it in the context that you know, I, I perceive if, if you keep doing this activity, you're going to fall away from the Lord. I don't know for sure that you will. But I know if you keep going to that place, keep going to these bars and drinking with these people, they're going to pull you aside. You keep dating this guy who doesn't believe and doesn't have a whole lot of, of faith in the Lord, he's going to draw you astray. I perceive that this will happen. But what I'm saying is we have to be careful the way we do things. And even Paul, being the great apostle, says, I I perceive this. You know, he put it in a proper context when he had a feeling about certain things. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. For what we see, the struggles that Paul had to go through in order to fill the Word of the Lord in His life. Lord, thank You that You don't make our way easy. Thank You, Lord, that as we share, not everybody is saved. Thank You, Lord, that some people may even be drawn even further away. We don't understand Your purposes, but we acknowledge them, O Lord. And Father, I pray that You would teach us to guard our words to speak in proper context and to not take words that, that, that we think that you have spoken and to project them forth as if you've spoken them. Father, I pray for these young people that you would keep them seeking you and seeking your face. May the grace of God be upon them. Father, I pray that you would teach them to learn from your word, to be instructed from the truth of God and your grace be upon them, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.